got to have these gentlemen bring my drinks on for me. I'm having sex with all of these people. I know, lovely, right? Not the one on the right, he's very brutal. Um, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please welcome to the stage, Jalice! Stop it, stop it. You're very kind. Hello, everyone, you all right? <laughs> Welcome to the show. It's called That's the Way Aha Aha Joe Lies It. <laughs> I'm fucking thrilled with it, I cannot tell you. <laughs> Did anyone buy tickets just based on that name? <laughs> fuck, fuck off. Did you? <laughs> You're going to be very disappointed. Very serious theatre piece, actually. Oh, look at this front row at my DVD. Everyone looks... Well, most people look very well-dressed. Oh, look, that's a nice shirt. Is that, oh, is that Ralph Lauren? Oh, my word, someone's got money. <laughs> What's your name, sir? Hello, Richard, I'm Joe. It's me. <laughs> what do you do, Richard? A uh, scientist. A scientist in my audience. <laughs> oh, my word. Normally thick as shit, Richard says. So what a treat. What sort of science do you do? Uh, I make dermatological... Drug things. dealer. Yeah. Dermatological yeah. things for skin, that is. I know words. <laughs> so, um, I've got a bit of a rash, actually. <laughs> so I've been using Umovate. Is that not good? I should use semen. I should use semen. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think you were coming to? <laughs> oh, you're coming to... <laughs> Come on, have some respect. It's my DVD. Jesus. <laughs> I should jizz on my feet. That's what you're saying. <laughs> my mum and dad in. <laughs> mum and dad are in, and I've got a jizz on my feet, man. What a finale that would be to the show. Can you imagine? <laughs> it was very really funny. It was very really funny. And then he just jizzed on his feet. It was really. And because he was like under pressure, it took him ages to get it out. But it's like really. <laughs> so, are you a homosexual? I'm uh, not. You're not. No. Oh, somebody laughing at that. <laughs> Disbelief. Have you got a girlfriend? Uh, no. No? You're looking? Yeah. I don't believe you. <laughs> you say yes, but... So who's, who are you here with? This gentleman here. Hello there, what's your name? I'm Chris. Hello, Chris. How do you know each other? Uh, went to college together. Yeah. You gave the answer and then you went, yes, I'm a girlfriend. As if to say, this isn't a grinder day, but it is. <laughs> okay, went to college together, okay. And are you a scientist as well? I'm not, no. You're not, no. Oh, you seem disappointed. What do you, I, what do, you do? I do digital marketing. Digital marketing. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I really expected better, really, on the front. No, it's so nice to meet you both. Thank you for coming along. I hope you enjoy the show. Have a lovely life. Bye-bye. <laughs> I now need to get up with a level of dignity. <laughs> Your dress is lovely. Where's that from? Tesco. Tesco? <laughs> rich in anywhere. <laughs> from Tesco? That's nice, though, from Tesco. Lovely. Wearing flip-flops, so... Everything going well for you? Yeah. <laughs> really? Right, hang on. How am I going to do this now? <laughs> I could do a yoga DVD, couldn't I? <laughs> and this is the lying down. And that's the end. <laughs> that's my kind of yoga. Did you like my kick? So, I've pulled my back out when I did it, so... <laughs> worth it, though. Oh, gosh, lovely. Well, welcome along. I've got... Right, so, there's a few things going to happen. Um, there's a thing about... I feel like we should talk about parking fines. <laughs> Some recognition in the room. I did... So, I got a parking fine last year, and I can... Yes. <laughs> Hello there, hi, hi. Um, you didn't give me the parking fine, did you? I'm still looking for that bastard. Um, I got a parking fine last year, and I contest all parking fines, because I do fuck all in the days, basically. <laughs> it's quite funny what happened, so I thought, well, I'll pop that in the show. Then I did it on television, I thought, well, no one will watch that, I can still do it in the show. The thing went bloody viral, didn't it? <laughs> I ended up on the Lad Bible. <laughs> the Lad Bible! If you don't know what the Lad Bible is, it's very similar to the normal Bible, really. <laughs> in, uh, 
in that it's read mainly by homophobes. So, um, <laughs> yeah. The comments. Oh, my God. Ooh, quite funny for a puff. I can't think of Great. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so, yes, what I'll do... So, I'll do you a director's cut version of it, because a few extra things have happened. Basically, this is a bit of helpful advice. I know we're in London and parking's a nightmare here. There's a thing called a subject access request. It's part of the Data Protection Act 1998. I do fuck all in the days. <laughs> what it is, you can request any and all information that a company or an institution has on you, and it's such a fabulous waste of their time, because no one's real dream when they were growing up, when I grow up, I want to be a parking prick. Like, nobody wanted that themselves. <laughs> These people just want to coast through life. They don't want any extra admin. If you give them some, they hate it. They normally go away. This is an ongoing one, which um, isn't a parking fine, actually. This is... Um, this, I was driving in the wrong lane and they gave me a fine for that. I know, bloody squares. Uh, <laughs> you killed, like, three people. Um, <laughs> now, I'm not sure what I can say legally as to where this is, so what I'll do is I'll do a version for the DVD. This was in London. And a real version. This was Lambeth fucking council. <laughs> Um, I did a subject access request to them. Uh, they didn't reply within 30 days, so they're breaking the law. And as you know, I love the law. So <laughs> I sent them an email that included this sentence, just to give you an idea of the tone of the things I write. Might I add that if I fail to observe your deadlines, you have the power to hand out additional fines, whereas I have only diminished powers, such as sending emails like this and just generally making myself a slight nuisance. <laughs> However, I will be judged merely by your human laws, whereas you will be judged at the gates of hell! <laughs> an idea of the tone of the things I write. Okay. <laughs> so now, this one... This was, um, this was up north. I got a parking fine up north. I panic park, you see. I get to shows late and I just leave the car wherever's near. M42, that'll be fine. Just leave that there. <laughs> so this one, I got up north. So yes, I, um, I did a subject access request. I got an email from someone called Steph, who wrote, Mr Lysett, I passed your email onto the Freedom of Information team. As if they have a whole team <laughs> of information. That means one person. And by that definition, I've had sex with a team of people. <laughs> Hopefully, they'll be in touch with you soon. Steph. Now, I didn't like that word, hopefully. I thought that was vague. Could mean next week, next year. Could mean anything. So I went back to bloody Steph, didn't I? I said, Steph, sadly, hopefully, doth butter no parsnips. <laughs> Which is uh, an old Victorian phrase. Trying to bring back trending, basically. I don't know, hashtag butter parsnips. Come up with a hashtag in your own time. Can I have an email address for the person you've contacted at the FOI team? My lawyers would like to contact them directly. My lawyers do not exist. <laughs> You have been very helpful, and hopefully you won't get caught up in the forthcoming. I thought it was vague enough as a threat. Could it could mean anything? Could just go and glass the woman, couldn't I? Just go and glass her. <laughs> she replied, Mr. Lysett, I'm not sure what you mean about buttered parsnips. <laughs> I have CC'd in the FOI team who will advise. Then I got an email from someone called Colin, who I imagine talks like this. Hello. <laughs> Wanking as he wrote this email. Hello. <laughs> Mr. Lysett, your request is very broad, and so I have assumed you only want information pertinent to your recent parking fine. Pertinent? Get in the fucking bin, Colin. <laughs> I imagine that's the moment he jizzed. Pertinent! Just like so pleased with himself. <laughs> Attached is the evidence we have, which is a photograph of your car clearly parked in a taxi rank. Here is that photograph. There it is. <laughs> Very blurry for a start. It was like this weird chalky thing that had been written on the side window. Not good enough evidence, that isn't. There's no evidence of an actual taxi rank there. Wouldn't stand up in court, and I would take it that far. I do nothing in the days. <laughs> so I went back to bloody Colin, didn't I? I said, Colin! When you assume you make an ass out of you and me. <laughs> Is prickish enough for a kickoff? I see that your evidence is nothing more than a picture of the words taxi rank written on my car. I would argue this evidence is insufficient. I also put P.S. Apologies for the delay in replying to your previous email. I'm currently on the Costa del Sol. I provided evidence of this. Just attach this picture. <laughs> uh, did in my bed in Birmingham, didn't I? Colin replied, Mr. Lys... Mr. Lysett, sorry. 
crystallise it. In order to reverse the fine, you'll need to provide evidence your vehicle was not in a taxi rank. That's bullshit, legally, but I went back to him anyway. I said, Colin, evidence supplied. I was actually parked on the moon, as you can see clearly here. Just <laughs> attached. That one there. Put that on an app on my phone in ten seconds. <laughs> Mr Lysett, I've cancelled the fine. <laughs> a victory for the common man, I would say. <laughs> and bless you. <laughs> You'll notice, you'll notice taxi rank is still written on the window there. <laughs> it was there for months. It didn't take off for months. So um, I did this show, a version of this show, right next to that parking space a few months... Mu- Sorry, taxi rank, it's a minor difference. Um, <laughs> next to the taxi rank. And so after the show, I parked the car there again. I got the whole audience out. We took a photograph. Here is that photograph. There we all are. Having a <laughs> time. And I sent that to Colin. I just said, Sorry, Colin, I've done it again. <laughs> No reply, I'll let you know. (laughs) Yes, you'll notice as the show goes on, I do all of my confrontation online, you see. I'm basically an online troll, essentially, (laughs) as well. So I'm not good at, like, real-life confrontation. I've been trying to get more, like, a bit more manly. I've I've got into football. (laughs) So I'm from Birmingham. I'm as surprised as you are. And (laughs) I support West Brom. Are there any football supporters in? Oh, some people. Oh, you support. Who do you support? Ipswich Town. Ipswich Town. (laughs) Fuck (laughs) it. They're taking over. (coughs) Hello there. Is everything okay? (laughs) Are they they good? Are they doing all right? So I started becoming a fan of West Brom because my friend Karen said that they're the best team, statistically inaccurate. That. (laughs) So we went to watch one game. We went to watch one in the. um, Stadium. So I forgot the word stadium there. I was going to say velodrome. I can't do football. <laughs> I can watch one in the stadium. But before that, we went to this proper old man pub in Birmingham. And, like, the woman behind the bar, how to describe her? She looked like a scrotum. <laughs> she didn't like me, because I ordered a white wine spritzer. <laughs> Fuck's that? <laughs> soda water and white wine. She went behind the bar for a worrying amount of time. Came back with a pint of soda water and a full bottle of dessert wine. I don't know, that would be a fiver. Best night of my life. I love the football. Oh, I, did, I got caught out at one point because I shouted, Come on, the lads. Apparently, that's not acceptable as a phrase. Yes. I love an old man pub as well. Because I go with my friend Karen quite a lot. And there's one in Birmingham. Um, it's called the Tap and Spile. And it's open until about 4am every night. And it's like full of proper brummies with no neck. And um, <laughs> I haven't got a neck. And um, she got hit on the one night. This guy came up to her and he went, What's your name? And she went, Fuck off. And he went, That's a lovely name. <laughs> And he asked her what her favourite TV show is. She said Sex in the City. And he went, how oh, hard I like Sex on the City, you know. <laughs> it's a good joke, that. It's a bloody good joke. Um, but yes, I'm not that masculine, not that, um, not that good at confrontation. I did have to do some confrontation recently. You do a lot of driving with this job. And I stopped recently at a service station, quite late at night, just getting some food. I wasn't getting any fuel. And this gentleman got off a motorbike behind me, who'd obviously worked on one muscle group more than the others in the gym. So it's quite sort of top-heavy, then sort of withered down below. It looked like a cornetto with a head. Like a spinning top shaped into a twat. Very aggressive, very aggressive, really pushy. I went to the service station, he pushed in behind me. I went over to have a look at the sandwiches, and he shouted to the woman behind the counter, who was sat there with a little e-cigarette, which was giving out a sarcastic amount of smoke, really, just sort of billowing around. Her. She looked like she was on bloody stars in their eyes, just like there. And, there. and he shouted, why isn't the pump on? And she went, it's after ten, you have to pay first, that's the rule. And he went, oh, what, you don't think I can pay for it? She went, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. It's after ten, you have to pay first. That's the rule for everybody. I think it's at the point when he picked up a fire extinguisher and started swinging it around. I became really fascinated in the sandwiches at that point. I was like, oh, my God, chicken and bacon? Oh, I'm going to read the ingredients on this one. Just staring out blind fear. He's like, nobody thinks I can't pay for this. You, mate, pointing at me. You think I can pay for it. I'm not sure how I did this because I was nervous and frightened, but I think I just went... (laughs) Shitting myself. Put the fire extinguisher down. He said, if you don't put that pump on, when I go out there, I'm going to create big problems for you. She said, I'm not going to put the pump on. He did my favourite thing anyone's done in anger. He just threw a Twix on the ground. (laughs) Seems like a reasonable response, doesn't it? The old Twix throwing trick. 
he went over fanning out with his motorbike. I went over with a prawn mayonnaise, if you're interested. And she started, started scanning it really slowly. And I said, are you going to put that pump on? And she went, no. <laughs> Delighted, relishing in it. I scuttled back to the car, locked the doors. He tried to get back into the service station, but cleverly she'd locked the doors to there. So he tried to kick them in, but didn't work. He's withered down below. So <laughs> picked up a pack of fire logs, started swinging them at the 24 hour window. She knows it's bulletproof glass, so she was just laughing. And just got, <laughs> smoke pissing everywhere. I started the car, tried to drive round, but I'm a polite driver. I'm not going to like beat my horn or anything. He was in the way. So I just. I need the prawn sandwich, to be honest. It's not even... <laughs> One thing I forget to do when I'm in the Ford Fiesta is, um, and I slipped that in, didn't I? Someone's got some bloody dollar, haven't they? <laughs> Ford Fiesta. The lights are always sort of on, and there's a little switch, and if you go a little bit, it goes on to sort of mini beam, and if you go a bit further, it goes on to full beam. And because I was nervous and frightened, I clicked onto full beam, but very quickly clicked back, but essentially flashed him. <laughs> he turned and looked at me through the windscreen with these fire logs, just staring into my soul for what felt like an eternity. I farted out of nervousness again. <laughs> and then he just went, oh, so sorry, mate, and walked out of the way. <laughs> I stalled the car and drove home to Berlin. It's a good night. It's a good night. Now, we, um, before the show, I asked you to send in some tweets. Did people see this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Before the show, yeah, I asked you to send in some tweets of... I've really got into gay puns, basically. It's one of my new favourite things. I also, I'm slightly obsessed with drag names as well, because I've created a drag act, which is Nigella Farage. Uh, <laughs> she's incredibly racist, whilst making a goat Massaman curry is the idea. <laughs> Some of the names of drag acts, lowest common denominator is my favourite. But... <laughs> This started because a friend of mine mentioned to me the Gay Olympics a while back and I stopped listening to everything he said then because I was thinking of games that you could play at the Gay Olympics. <laughs> he talked for like five minutes, I took none of it in and then just went, Jizkus! Um, <laughs> really, really killed the mood with synchronised rimming, but... Um, <laughs> I, it's a good one! It's a good one! <laughs> Pop, put... <laughs> yeah, there's loads. But... So I asked you to tweet in, because I've exhausted those, I asked you to tweet in with uh, gay TV shows. And um, what my favourite with these is when someone has a go, but it's shit. <laughs> you can see they've really tried, but you've had some genuinely really good ones as well. For example, um, this one from Lucy. Anton Dix Push the Bell End isn't a... <laughs> it's not a thing. Where are you? Lucy Campbell, where are you, Lucy? Give me a wave. Hello, Lucy, right at the back. Quite right. <laughs> You oh my god, you sent in loads. I'm a gay, get me out of here. <laughs> King of the dildo, what? <laughs> Keeping up with the cums, and you just put in brackets Kardashians. <laughs> Ten followers, now we know why. <laughs> the big wang theory, I like that, that's good. And then instead of a touch of frost, a touch of cock. Dongs of praise, that's more like it. <laughs> Dongs of praise. Well done. Jennifer liked that. Fresh Prince of Bel End. <laughs> yeah. Third cock from the bum, that's nice. That's a nice. Sweet one, that one, isn't it? Lovely. A place in the bum, <laughs> lovely, nice. Homos under the hammer, that sounds like a threat. <laughs> Thomas the Wank Engine, that's it. That's all we're after. That's Bill Richards. Where are you, Bill? Hello. Oh, you, sorry, but you weren't expecting to be. Hello, Bill. That would like a lovely shirt as well. Very well dressed, Bill. Let's have a look at your profile. Odd, I love comedy. Not all tweets are live. Curry and conversation. Views mostly my own. Work for a uni. Block. <laughs> you did so many. Oh my god, how many have you done? At least 12 here. Peppa's Prick. <laughs> Peppa Pig, that you Peppa's Prick. <laughs> Dick in Dom's Bungalow. Nice. <laughs> Why are they all kids' TV show? I'm worried about you. <laughs> Tracy's Beaver, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Tracy's Beaver? 
Great British baked off my tits. <laughs> I mean, I love it. 655 followers. 656 now. There you go. I'm following. I'm following, yeah. Um, um, Gobblecocks, love that. <laughs> right, this is horrible. One torn every minute. <laughs> I'm worried about all of you. I'm really worried. <laughs> Round of applause for everyone who said those in. They're so good, so funny. There's, there's an after-show counsellor you can speak to if you'd like to as well after the show. Um, yeah, we, I've done that at different tour shows, I, and I do different things. I've, uh, we did, oh, we did um, gay landmarks in Salford when I did a show in Salford, and people did things like anal of the north, that kind of thing. <laughs> Somebody tweeted in, ouch fists. <laughs> Completely unacceptable. <laughs> Let's move on. I want to talk to you today about Birmingham. So, yes, I'm from... Bir oh, you're from, are you from Birmingham? Oh, which part of Birmingham are you from? Tamworth. Not, not Birmingham at all. <laughs> Tamworth. OK, lovely. Are you from Birmingham as well? Yeah. Where are you from? Great Bar. Great Bar. Oh, lovely. Smashing. I'm from Hall Green. Do you know it? Uh, very well. V very well. <laughs> not that well. You're not outside my house. <laughs> So, because there's a waitrose in Hall Green, that's the thing. That we get the idea of the sort of quality of. I was, out, I was outside the waitrose. You don't have a waitrose in Great Bar, do you? Not that I'm aware. No, you don't have roads in Great Bar. You just sort of <laughs> wander around vomiting on one another, don't you? Um, yes, I was outside the waitrose in Hall Green the other day. I saw a squirrel eating a croissant. <laughs> that was too much for me. Oh, and there was. There was a woman on her telephone the one day, she was speaking so loudly, and she went, no, it's Colin apostrophe S, because it's the racist opinion belonging to Colin. <laughs> Colin sounds like a hoot, doesn't he? We've got, we've got an Aldi now, that's what we've got as well, that's caused upset with the locals. I, I like it, because it's the only place you can buy a pint of milk and a wheelbarrow wheel in the same shop. <laughs> it's a great thrill, but... um. Yes, I live, uh, I live in, um, in Hall Green with my mother and father, Dave and Helen. Great couple of lads. All right. And, um, <laughs> this is my lad knee, by the way. Oh, um, I don't know if there are any mothers in or if anyone's had a mother, but um, <laughs> my mother, a great warrior, my mother. She's got worse as she's got older as well. She bought, me, she bought me a first aid kit for the car. I do mainly motorway driving. Not sure how useful a first aid kit's going to come in in a smash on the M6. <laughs> I'm going to ring 999 and go, well, my condition is my legs are crushed to bits and I've got a bit of metal sticking out of my abdomen and according to this thermometer, a slightly higher than normal temperature. <laughs> no, no, don't send the fire brigade to cut me out. I've got these tiny little scissors. <laughs> She's, uh, she's also on social media as well. She searches my name to see what I'm up to when I'm away from home. She's not going to be pleased with Tracy's beaver, I can tell you that. <laughs> she also, she started replying to my tweets, and I try, like, jokes and one-liners on Twitter. I did one as an example. It was, um, did you know it takes 36 muscles to smile, but only one muscular guy in the gym to give me a boner? <laughs> it's a silly, away joke, nothing to worry about. She replied, no, I didn't know that. Thanks, son. <laughs> Got her back, though, because Wimbledon was on, so I did a Wimbledon joke. It was, why, when women play tennis, do they sound like they're having an orgasm? And why does my mother play tennis in the bathroom? <laughs> she was livid! 120 retweets, spin on that, Helen. It's a good day. So, yes, live in Birmingham, live in Birmingham. Um, Birmingham was described recently on Fox News, the reputable news source that is Fox News, as 100% Muslim. <laughs> salam alaikum. <laughs> alaikum salam is what you say back. Don't worry, we'll work it out. It's interesting that, because I was in the Middle East when that news came out. I was doing shows. I was in Abu Dhabi, Doha and Dubai. Friends of mine told me not to go to the Middle East because they said that they don't like, and I quote, my lot, is what they said. <laughs> Not sure what they mean by my lot. Presumably fly fishers. <laughs> they, um, they jail homosexuals in those countries. Not sure of the logic of that one, really. Oh, you like men? We'll put you in a box with some. Not a punishment. 
Come on, try harder, lads. I thought, I thought that they stoned gays to death out there, but it's just that gays can't catch. Right. Structurally, a very good joke, that, but it's on the edge. I agree. Now... 100% Muslim. I said 100% Muslim. There's a sort of truth in it. There's a lot of Muslims in Birmingham. A lot of all cultures there. We're known for being multicultural. Quite good at it, really. Our next-door neighbours are Muslim. Saj, he's a lovely guy. Loves a fucking power tool on a Sunday, but he's a lovely guy. <laughs> Shut up, Saj! One of the most famous Muslims in Birmingham is Malala Yousafzai. I don't know if people are familiar with her. If you don't, she's brilliant. She's an 18-year-old schoolgirl who was shot at by the Taliban for wanting to be educated. She now goes to... Edgebaston High School for Girls. It's a private school. I don't think she pays the fees. <laughs> I personally would hate to go to school with Malala Yousafzai. Can you imagine show and tell day with Malala where they're like, OK, class, what have you brought in? Um, Sally, let's start with you. And Sally goes, I've brought in this papa mache cat. <laughs> OK, anyone else bring anything? Malala, did you bring anything in? this Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Sally, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> I'd hate to be a teacher as well. You want me to tell Malala off or anything? What are you doing on your phone, Malala? Texting Barack Obama, actually, so... <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, Sally, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> Poor Sally, just made her up. Um... No, I was annoyed about that. I was annoyed when that news came out. I'm annoyed with Donald Trump as well. Little side project I've got going on. I'm trying to book Syrian refugees into Donald Trump's hotels. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> it's going OK. It's going OK. I was annoyed when, yeah, when Fox News said that we're 100% Muslim because there's a subtext to that. When they say we're 100% Muslim, what they're saying there is that we should be worried about that. There's something terrifying, frightening about Muslims. I think we've got a problem. I think we're using the word Muslim far too quickly to describe people doing atrocities when they don't represent Muslims any more than I do. And I think we should be using a more accurate word for those people, which I'm going to argue is knobhead. <laughs> There'd be levels of knobhead. You'd have a moderate knobhead all the way up to fundamental knobhead. And if we all did it, if we all did it, the news would have to catch up. They'd have to go, today, two knobheads bombed a car. They'd have to do it if we all did it. And it wouldn't necessarily be to do with just terrorist activity. Any knobheady activity would get the knobhead word. I've thought of some. Um, people that wear a festival wristband after a festival. <laughs> I went to Reading. It's November, you're in a Costa. You're a knobhead. <laughs> Couples that put a lock on a bridge, you're both knobheads. Sorry. <laughs> Hate that. Hate it. Um, sanctimonious mothers. I've got to be careful here. I don't mean all mothers. Just a lot of my friends are having children at the minute. And it's the sort of mothers that go, don't tell me how to raise my kids. And you're like, OK, but... She is trying to eat a petit velu with an electric razor, so... <laughs> You're a bit of a knobhead, aren't you? Ever so slightly. <laughs> Amanda Holden, fundamental knobhead. I just don't like it. <laughs> don't, don't encourage me, because I'm sure she's lovely. I just... I think she's despicable. <laughs> she did to our Les. Um, <laughs> Still holding on to that after ten years. <laughs> oh, lovely bit of tequila. Um, yes. No, I don't have. Um, I don't have a problem with Muslims in Birmingham at all. I'm happy to have them. I think they add to our city and to our culture. I think the. Thank you. Yes, thank you to the the one person agreeing. <laughs> we continue to this BNP rally. Um, <laughs> please welcome now Jennifer Art. <laughs> what was I talking about? It wasn't that long ago, was it? Muslims, yes. Um, I just hate Muslims. Oh, what was I saying? Sorry, um, <laughs> what's my political opinion again? Um, yes, no, I, I'm happy to have them in Birmingham. I think a big problem we have in Birmingham, it's happening everywhere, actually, at the minute. We have a lot of artisan coffee shops <laughs> full of kyants. I've started putting the letter Y into swear words. I don't know why, it just makes me happy. Let's get fucked up, it just makes me happy. I don't know why. <laughs> you know the sort of places I'm on about. Shoreditch, full of them. 
sort of places, they've got like distressed wood, that kind of thing. <laughs> and they'll serve flat whites, that's the drink. They'll often say things like, we support local artists. And you know that, because the art on the wall is shit. <laughs> There's dozens in Birmingham now, dozens, they're all shit. There's one I quite like, it's called York's Cafe Bakery. And they do an avocado and feta smash! <laughs> It's a very aggressive word, I feel. <laughs> what is essentially pressing with a fork. <laughs> Avocado and feta smash! And uh, for one pound, I think it is, one pound fifty extra, you can get a poached egg on top. Lovely way to start the day. I went in recently, I said to the girl, I said, I'd like the avocado and feta smash, please, with the poached egg. And she went, oh, we don't do the egg anymore. <laughs> and I said, why is that? And she went, the kitchen was struggling to cope. <laughs> When I hear the phrase, struggling to cope, <laughs> I think of, I don't know, a single mother trying to juggle a career, childcare, heartbreak. I don't think of someone cooking a fucking egg. <laughs> so I'm boycotting there now, I'm boycotting there now. But I do, I do occasionally send them an email. <laughs> just, just with the subject line, struggling to cope. <laughs> and a picture of me cooking an egg. It took me ages to get that picture right. I did like 40 on the phone. <laughs> we've got now as well, we've got a, we've got a 24 hour Starbucks in Birmingham. Nobody asked for one. We've got one. <laughs> the staff at 4 a.m., genetically closer to a moth. <laughs> I went in at 4 a.m. It's the early the ones. I came back late from a show. I thought I'll treat myself. I'll have a hot chocolate. Guy behind the counter obviously couldn't cope with daylight or anything. He was like, Can I take a name? And I said, Yeah, it's. Joe, can I ask why? He went, just in case the order gets confused. <laughs> Looked around an empty Starbucks. <laughs> I shuffled along to the service counter. Took him ages to make it. And then he went, hot chocolate for John. <laughs> so to make a point, I just waited. Well, <laughs> John will be here in a minute, won't he? Oh, he loves a hot chocolate, our John. I suppose it's, it's gentrification, isn't it? It's, gentr it's happening everywhere. I, um, I don't mind it really, because it's nice to have nice places to go out and whatever. I think my issue with it is that it sort of it jumped up at me, because I didn't go out for a while, because I was writing a sitcom about gay pirates. But um, <laughs> I, only, I only got two lines of dialogue, which is one of the characters goes, where's the treasure? And then somebody else goes, you're a treasure? <laughs> That's what I got. <laughs> <laughs> something in it, something in it. But then I started, started going out, and there's all these jazzy bars now, all these sort of quirky places. There's a gin parlour in Birmingham now. I went into the gin parlour, I ordered a gin and tonic. I thought that was appropriate. Very quirky guy behind the bar, tattoos, piercings, beard. He was like, we have 200 different types of gin. Is there a type of gin that you've had before? I like, yeah, I think it was Asda Price. I think it was... <laughs> Didn't have it, so not that exclusive. <laughs> had, a, had a vodka Diet Coke in the end. And I got chatting to this guy who was very thin... And very pallid. He sort of, he looked like someone had dressed up a mini milk. He didn't look right. <laughs> and he was chatting at me, mile a minute, for about half an hour. And then after about half an hour, he went, oh, I've lost my Coke. And I think because I was drinking a Diet Coke and I was a bit drunk, in the moment, I thought he meant Coca-Cola. So I was like, well, where'd you have it last? He's like, in the toilet. Like, well, there's no flat surfaces in there. You must have left it on the floor or something. He's like, no, I've lost my Coke. I was like, well, I'll get you some Coke. Still think he meant Coca-Cola. He's like, what, do you know a dealer? I like, don't see how that's relevant. I mean, I know, I know an art dealer I could call in the morning, but that seems very off topic. He's like, I'll get you some Coke. So I started walking to the bar and then realised on the way to the bar what he actually meant. I'm now on a drugs run for some stranger. How did this happen? And I don't take drugs. I've no idea how you pre cure drugs. I know, I know you can order them online now, which I find absolutely hysterical as an idea that they can go, sorry you're out. We left 50 kilograms of smack with your neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> Did my cocaine arrive? No, but Sag is really mowing that fucking lawn. <laughs> no idea how it works, do I? So, 
I needed a way. I needed a way. So I thought, I'll go and have a way. I'll work out what to do. So I went into a cubicle because I get stage fright. I can't urinate next to other men. And uh, thank you for laughing. It helps. And I <laughs> went for a wee at my nub and I popped the lid down on the toilet. And behind the lid was this little packet of powder. And I can see how he would have missed it. It just slipped down the back. But it created this moral quandary, really, because I don't have a problem with people taking drugs. Do whatever you like with your life. But I know cocaine, particularly, the way it's produced, the way it's brought into the country, there's a lot of blood on it. Pretty much every gram, somebody dies for it. It's a really horrendous industry that you're funding if you take it or buy it. And it makes me very uncomfortable and sad, really. But also, it's not my property. It's not up to me. It's not my decision. So I didn't know what to do. Anyway, I made £50. <laughs> punchline for you there, you're welcome. That's a heavy, oh, it's a bloody lecture now, it's a lecture. Do you know what, I was going to ask, I, would, I was talking there about not being able to use urinals. I've started to be able to do it. Um, I was going to say I need some help, but that sounds really wrong. Uh, basically, I went to the Glastonbury Festival for the first time uh, last year, and the toilets there... I have a rule. If you're doing a poo on somebody else's poo, <laughs> you've made a wrong decision in life. <laughs> let's reassess. Well, let's think things through. Um, so you just sort of have to get over yourself at Glastonbury. So about half the time now I can use a urinal, other half I still use a cubicle. But because I've never used a urinal before, I think I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> so by way of a cheer, who, when they're at a urinal, just gets the knob out? Okay. <laughs> who, who then does knob and balls? <laughs> right. I don't have any more options. <laughs> Th this gentleman here, what, did, what was your name? Hello, Peter. What do you do? Not for a profession with your knob and balls. <laughs> I treat myself. I sit down. With you cubicle. treat yourself and you sit down. <laughs> I'm obsessed with you, Peter. <laughs> Let's find out about you. So, you, so you've never used your... Surely you must have used a rhino at yes. some point. Uh, yes. What you, where are you from, Peter? I feel like you're... You remind me of Mr Tumnus. <laughs> um, so, yeah, what do you do, Peter? Retired. Are you retired? What are you doing with your retirement? Sitting down, having a piss? <laughs> Watching me? Oh, lovely. How's it going for you? Boring. Boring? Oh. <laughs> Ruin my big night, Peter. No, he's, he said it with a smile on his face, I think. Otherwise, I might have to smash the shit out of him. <laughs> so where do you live, Peter? Plymouth. Plymouth! Oh, well, God. Talk about boring, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Jesus. Um, so you've travelled then? Oh, lovely. Thanks for travelling. For me? Oh, it's getting a bit sinister now. <laughs> I'm going to leave the wife in the Holiday Inn. <laughs> lovely. OK, smashing, Peter. Well, have a lovely life. Bye-bye. <laughs> So hang on, I do knob and balls, is that weird? <laughs> yes. This gentleman here going, yes. What, one ball? How's that? Is that all right? <laughs> what do you do? Sans balls. Sans balls. <laughs> oh. Bonjour. <laughs> Sans balls. What a ballad. Um, but, uh, <laughs> so ju just the tip or do you unravel the whole thing? What are we talking <laughs> A fair bit comes out. A fair it? bit comes out. <laughs> Is this your partner who's having an absolute breakdown next to you? <laughs> a fair bit comes out. Oh, right, lovely, OK. Give me inches. <laughs> no, actually, well, Peter's upset now. So Peter's upset. Peter's goes all the way down to the bottom and rattles round, I imagine. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> One day I might just do full trousers down. Fuck it, skin to the wind. <laughs> Let's move off my knob. Um, yes, I want to talk now about my friend Claire. She is from Dudley. They have very thick accents in Dudley, you'll be familiar. She sort of, she talks like that, like she's waiting to die. <laughs> I love Claire, love Claire, but she's a few condoms short of an orgy. She, um, <laughs> she microwaves her clothes to dry them. <laughs> she never cleans the microwave, so she always smells of baked beans. <laughs> Coarse, coarse is the word for her. She's one of those friends you sort of feel like you have to apologise for her. You find it quite funny at the same time. We went to watch Mad Max at the IMAX. Brilliant film, recommend it. But midway through, there are these chastity belts. And she leant over to me very loudly in a very busy IMAX and she went, those chastity belts are shit. <laughs> I said, why'd you say that? And she went, well, as I always say, 
if you can get a poo out, you can get a knob in. <laughs> Something to live your life by, sure. <laughs> As you always say, never stop saying that, do you, Claire? Little catchphrase. <laughs> oh, and she's so bad with men, dreadful with men. She'll go through a different boyfriend every sort of two or three months, and you know they're a bad egg, just based on their name. She'll introduce me, she'll be like, this is Zane or Adolf or something, you just know. <laughs> and last one, so awful. She came round, she said, he's got this new sex thing where he likes to ejaculate on my face and take a photo of it. Like, That's... <laughs> Dreadful, and she went, and I don't know what face to pull. <laughs> <laughs> it's a valid question, isn't it? You go like, thank you, and then you go like, Sasa. Mm. No Snapchat filter in the world for that, is there? <laughs> yes, and she gets so drunk as well because we go out gay clubbing. We'll club a gay to death maybe once a month. <laughs> I'm so pleased with that joke when I wrote it. It's like, Take the month off, Joe. Fuck it. Because it's just a play on words as well. And I don't really engage with the gay community that often. There's one gay club which I love. It's called Hard Cock Life. And it's a gay hip-hop night. And it's because so, it's, it's very camp gay men paired off with very aggressive, often misogynist rap lyrics. So it'd be like, smashing the pussy. Yeah, smashing the pussy! That's like, really good. <laughs> I don't know if it's an avocado and feta smashing the pussy. I'm not sure. But it's a very good night out. But she gets so drunk, Claire. I had to put her in a cab before midnight the other week. She got this bag of chips covered in curry sauce. She's not very graceful in heels at the best of times. She sort of, she looks like when I put toilet rolls on my cat's legs. She's just sort of like... <laughs> just not with it. The taxi driver spotted her a mile off. He's like, you're not coming in this cab with those chips. And she went, all I want in my life is these chips. That's all I've ever wanted. He's like, if you soil the cab in any way, you'll have to pay a big fine. She's like, I won't. I promise you just want these chips. He was like, all right. I opened the door for her. She tripped and just pissed the chips into the cab. <laughs> all over the window, into the chair. And because she was so drunk, she just went, shh. Like pushing them into the road. She's not right. She's not right. But when, when she gets drunk, she comes up with these little wisdoms, these little philosophies. And one of them, I'm trying to live my life by, because it's just think it's absolutely brilliant. Claire thinks if somebody's difficult with you in life, awkward, making your life hard for any reason, shouldn't try and rationalise with them, shouldn't try and speak to them on their level, you should try and outweird them. <laughs> Which came in very usefully for me recently in my local post office. There's a woman there, she's been there about 20 years. I don't like her. She's smug, is the word. <laughs> One of those faces that's so smug it sort of folds into itself. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. <laughs> she looks like someone's punched a quiche. <laughs> And she's called Lorraine. <laughs> no, you're better than that. Um, and she's always got some quip, some line. I went in with my passport form, and they do a check and send service at the post office, and she licked her finger and she went through it. And she went, ah, oh, your referee has spelt neighbour wrong. And I went, what? She's like, it's missed out the H on neighbour. You'll have to fill it in again. I was like, surely that's all right. And she went, no, no. There can be no risk of any confusion as to what that word means. You'll have to fill it in again. Pushed it back at me. I thought, I'm not having this. It takes ages to fill out that form. You have to send off for it. You have to get a referee. I thought, I'm not having it. So I thought, I'll be a bit weird with her. So I went, oh, no, sorry. He's, um, he's not my neighbour. He's my doctor. She went, what? I said, he's misspelled doctor. So doctor's obviously spelled D-O-C-T-O-R. He spelled it N-E-I-G-B-O-U-R. He spelled doctor wrong. And she went... No, that clearly says neighbour. Oh, does I? <laughs> Did Keish face back it, I didn't know. I, um, I've been weird with people in real life, but um, my main work being weird with people is online, as I've said. A few examples of the sort of things that I do. There's a Starbucks that I know in Cardiff. It's not a 24-hour one, but they are next to a Strata. And so whenever I'm in Cardiff, I'll tweet the official Starbucks account with things like this. FYI, I'm on your Starbucks customers-only Wi-Fi, but I'm actually next door in Strata having a Prosecco, <laughs> and I don't give a shit. <laughs> I'll put pictures of me outside as well, just going, ha ha, got you, you bricks, that kind of thing. <laughs> this, this next one, mm, I, 
This next one, it's a humble brag, really. I shouldn't mention it. Basically, there's a gay magazine called Attitude Magazine, and they do a vote every year for the top 100 hottest men in the world. You can vote for anyone you'd like. I don't think this is my best work by any means. This is an Instagram post. I just thought I'd canvas for votes for myself, just posting, like, squeezing my face up, and I just said, please vote for me to be in the top 100. Not the best joke I've ever done. Uh, didn't think of it again until Attitude got in touch and invited me to the awards ceremony where they give out this magazine, the top 100. <laughs> nice of them to use my body on the front, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sort of people in this are like proper Hollywood, so like Channing Tatum's at number two, you've got Liam Payne from One Direction, Chris Pratt from Hollywood, David Beckham's at number eight. Somehow, as a result of that joke, <laughs> I'm the tenth hottest man in the world. <laughs> There's the picture. Lots of Photoshop going on there, lots of Photoshop. <laughs> Daniel Craig's at 13, I'm hotter than Daniel Craig! <laughs> so Katie Price is at the awards do where they give out the magazine and she treats this thing like my mum does with the Matalan catalogue because she's going through and going, oh, that would be lovely in the living room. <laughs> the joke there is she's a slag. Now, <laughs> just in case you weren't sure what the joke was there. No, I shouldn't have mentioned that, I shouldn't have mentioned it, because it's a humble brag and it sort of belittles my main work online, which is very important work, actually, very serious work that I do. <laughs> my main work online is I reply to Cheryl Cole's Instagrams. <laughs> very serious work. No, it's not Cheryl Cole, it's, it's um, Cheryl fernandez Nobed. That's it. She, <laughs> she's one of the worst culprits for what I call the posting of the bullshit quote. A lot of very uh, famous, attractive people do this. A lot of models do this. They'll post a quote, normally to Instagram, that feels like it has some meaning, some worth in your life, but it absolutely doesn't. Here is an example of one such quote that was posted. Four plus three equals seven, but five plus two also equals seven. <laughs> Follow your own path. <laughs> so I did one of my own. Tag Cheryl in. Sometimes the self-service is no quicker than the normal checkout. Follow your own path. <laughs> I did another one as well. Sometimes the sat-nav hasn't updated yet and takes you down a road that doesn't exist anymore. Follow your own path. <laughs> you get the gist, you get the gist. I've gone one further as well. I've set up my own hashtag. It's hashtag bullshit quotes I just made up. And I have two rules. I can't have thought about the quote for longer than 10 seconds. And then I post it, whatever it is, uh, in a nice font onto Instagram, tagging the sort of people that do this. So Cheryl Cole, the Kardashians, Cara Delevingne. She can get in the fucking bin. Um, <laughs> it's this, this sort of thing, just to give you an example. Life is for the living. If you're not living, you're dead. <laughs> Feels nice. It feels there's a rhythm to it. Means nothing. Made it up in ten seconds. Uh, this one's a sciencey one. In science, a negative attracts a positive, which is why I think you're a twat. <laughs> and then my absolute favourite, which this is done so well on social media. I'm so proud of this. Life is like a box of chocolates. It doesn't last long if you're fat. <laughs> Good old wholesome advice, that one, really. If you see these, please at me in or put the hashtag. I love reading them. I might make a blog of them or something. I just think they're fascinating insight into humanity at this stage. Um, one person I wasn't familiar with before, a few people linked me to, is a pornographic actress. Watch, watch out. Um, <laughs> she's called Isis Taylor. I can't do, I can't put a picture up um, for legal reasons, so I've done a drawing. <laughs> That's my drawing of her. She posts a lot to Twitter. She also foolishly, on one occasion, posted her email address. <laughs> Sent her a little email, didn't I? <laughs> Dear Isis, I have been a loyal and devoted fan of your work as an actress for a number of years now, and have long thought that you are a beautiful and talented performer. However, my opinion of you was changed after I read a recent front-page newspaper article about you. I am shocked and concerned, Isis, to learn that you have taken over swathes of Iraq and eastern Syria. <laughs> and intend to create an Islamic caliphate in the region. I implore you to see sense and return to your porn career in San Francisco. Yours with concern, I used an alias, Paul Paulington. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> No reply. <laughs> I have 
I have been trying to solve the problem of ISIS. Don't worry, I, not the porn star, the, the terrorist. Any members of ISIS here? No. <laughs> I was thinking, why would you join ISIS? I was trying to work out why you'd join them. I think the people that join ISIS feel like there's a lack of love in their lives. I don't think you can join ISIS if you feel loved. And I was thinking, where is there an abundance of love? And I realised it's Grinder. <laughs> so I've signed up to Grinder, posting as an ISIS militant. Go with me. <laughs> um, if you don't Grinder, if you don't know what it is, it's a gay dating app. That's what it is. You, you're bloody hell, you know about it, don't you? <laughs> It's not dating, really, either. It's just a fuck fest, really. But um, <laughs> first conversation was with Craig. He said, lol, are you ISIS? I said, yes, death to the West. <laughs> he said, OMG, I know a drag act called Alexandra Burke. You'd love her. <laughs> <laughs> Alexandra Burke? I'd go and see that. But I was in character as an ISIS militant, so it doesn't sound very good. I said, yeah, to be fair, it is shit. <laughs> Wanna meet? So success, somebody willing to love someone from ISIS. Um, next one was um, James. I was pleased with this. James put, Wanna blow? I said, what building? <laughs> he said, okay. <laughs> Tell me more about yourself. I said, I serve the Islamic State. He said, I serve in Wagamama's. <laughs> And then I didn't reply for a bit because I was a bit busy. So then he sent me another message. He said, tell me, if you could do anything, what would you want to do to me? So I said, I would destroy you and your civilization." <laughs> he said, that's hot. <laughs> Where shall we meet? I said, in hell. <laughs> I said, is that a nightclub? <laughs> I'm probably somewhere. Um, final one. Oh, Barry, bless Barry. He put um, ASL, which means age, sex, location, if you're not familiar. I said, 18, male, Syria. <laughs> He said, Syria, question mark. I said, yes, I'm serious. <laughs> he said, ha-ha, I'm in Milton Keynes. <laughs> I said, Milton Keynes is full of whores, we're all going to hell. He put, OMG, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, he's so funny, so funny. <laughs> ongoing project, that one, ongoing. I did, um, did have to be weird with someone in real life recently. I went on, I went on a stag do. Uh, right. I'm trying to get that right. I think it's all in the neck. Fucking what? Uh, like that's his place, isn't it? Uh, it's amazing how close to vomiting that is. Uh, is it there? Uh, that's it, close. This is a front for insecurity. I've got it. Struggle to connect with my father. I've got it. I've got it. Oh, actually, she quite lonely? Yes, I've got it. <laughs> no, I didn't go with absolute lads like that. I went with um, old school friends of mine. Um, we went to Lisbon. They have a nickname for me, which is why we've done the show at this uh, theatre. It is The Duchess. So I am The Duchess at The Duchess. It sort of fits, doesn't it, the nickname? They've got a whole backstory for The Duchess. The Duchess has a butler called René. I don't know why he's called René, but I love it. And René will provide people for The Duchess to make love to that he's found on Tinder. I'm obsessed with Tinder. If you don't know what I'm on about. It's a dating app where you get a little picture of a human, and if you like the look of them, you swipe right, and if you don't, you swipe left, and you never hear from them again. Quite an abrupt way of measuring a human, I feel. It wouldn't work in real life. You wouldn't walk round a bar going, no, nah! that's a bit much. <laughs> ah! well, maybe you would. I don't know how you live your lives, but... Um... They're nice guys. They're nice guys. We've been friends for years. But there was a new guy on the stag who I'd not met before. Johnny, in the TA. Johnny actually works mainly in financial services, but he went on about the TA a lot. I don't even know what it stands for. I think it just means the army. I don't know. <laughs> How would I describe Johnny? A full kiant would be about right. <laughs> he, he'd met gay people before, he'd met straight people, but he'd not met anyone bisexual. I'm bisexual. I'm not sure if that was made clear to you at the door. Um, <laughs> Out of interest, are there any bisexuals in? You don't have to cheer if you don't want to. 
Oh, loads of you. Hi, hello, how welcome, welcome. Um, somebody down here, great, marvellous. Do you get when when, people, when you say you're bisexual? Do people are people confused by that sometimes? Yes, you're nodding. So this is the thing. I get I get it's confusing because I was confused when I first emerged sexually. My first kiss when I was about sixteen was with a woman outside the Snobs nightclub in Birmingham. If you <laughs> if you don't know it, the name is ironic. And um, <laughs> we're both both very drunk, and she burped in my mouth. <laughs> And that, and that triggered my gag reflex. So I, I was then sick on her shoes. No, they're only from New Look, chill out. But it made, me, it made me think for a long time that I was full gay because I thought that women made me physically sick. That's what I thought for a long time. Do you, people say you're greedy as well. Oh, fucking hell, spare me. Right, this is the thing. It's not about the frequency of sex. It's about who you're attracted to. That's literally all the word means. I, um, I can't speak for other bisexuals. I feel like I can't speak for other men, but I feel like there's a presumption that all men are up for it at all times. Like all men are going like, oh yeah, fuck that one ever. Like, I don't have that libido. Maybe that makes me unusual. I just don't have it. I look at a very comfortable sofa in the same way that I think most people look at a sexy person <laughs> for the things I do to that. <laughs> Lie down in a snack, that's what I'd do. If Tinder for sofa, swipe right the whole bloody day, that's what I would do. It's called Airbnb, I know it's an app. And, uh, I also get very frustrated with the language of sexuality as well, because I know we've got work to do there, because the three main words that we use are homosexual, heterosexual and bisexual. All of these words just to do with gender, and only gender. For example, if you say you are a heterosexual male, literally all that means is you are attracted to women. But of course, you won't be attracted to all women. You'll be attracted to a type of woman, blonde, brunette, your partner, whoever it is. And so I feel like it's more nuanced than that, more complex. I prefer the word pansexual. Then people think you're fucking things in the kitchen, so I don't know <laughs> Stuff. And I don't know what I want really because sometimes I feel like I just want us all to be fluid and no one ever comes out but then you would never have the coming out story and my favourite story in the land is a coming out story it's my friend Sam, he's a full gay and he lives <laughs> at home with his parents as I do and he just got the confidence the one night, I don't know where from and his mum was in the bath so he went and he knocked on the bathroom door and she put a towel around, she came to the door and she said what is it Sam? and he went mum, I'm gay and she went, well, I don't need this anymore. <laughs> I said, gay, not incestuous. <laughs> Running for the town. I love that story so much. I love it. So, yeah, I get that it's confusing, and I'd happily have a conversation with anyone about it at any point. I think sexuality is fascinating. I think it's something we should talk about more, really. But, um... Uh, Johnny, in the TA. His response to his confusion was to sort of try and bully me. It was the worst form of bullying because it was sort of undercurrent, so you couldn't prove it, but it was constant. It was things like, I think this reveals a lot about him, every time he got drunk, he kept getting his knob out and showing it to me, going, oh, you like that, don't you? Like, Bloody don't like it, Jesus. It's a car crash of genitalia. <laughs> His knob did to my knob. You know when you touch a snail on its eye and it goes... <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. Turned it into a vagina. <laughs> uh, I told Mum that he kept getting his knob out and she went, too much Afghanistan. What does that mean? <laughs> like, like there's a perfect quantity of Afghanistan apparently. Oh, no more Afghanistan for me. I'm so full of Afghanistan. <laughs> He, uh, he presumed I was gay. Often people do. How could you? I don't know how. But um, it's fine. I think it's interesting. When I said, oh, no, I'm, I'm actually bisexual, I think he thought I was asking for sex advice with women because he immediately went, oh, well, women like you to take control in the bedroom. I said, well, I didn't ask, but let's see where this goes. <laughs> said, well, when I'm with a girl, I'll be like, go over there. <laughs> Why is she over there? <laughs> how long she cocked on it? Yeah, you've got to be the boss in the bedroom. I haven't got time for invoicing. <laughs> There's some accounts midway through. Oh, this was awful as well, because he was really hypersex, like really high libido. We're in central Lisbon. This girl walked past us, and he leant over to her, and he's like, oh, she's fit, isn't she? I was like, she's clearly underage. There's grass on the wicket, let's play cricket. Like, People are still saying that sort of thing. So to appease it, I made up my own rhyme. <laughs> if you want to be a gent... Get their consent. You know, it's a wrong one. Could have, uh, could have hashtag feminism. And 
was there, I did want to be at loggerheads with him for the whole time because I've never been to Lisbon before, so I wanted to see that. I hadn't seen my mates for ages. So I thought, I'll ask him about his life, see if I can get him to open up. So I said, oh, what's it like being in the TA? How does that work? And he went, oh, well, uh, probably go on a tour in the next couple of years. So, oh, a tour? What are you doing? Art centres? Theatres? <laughs> Just keeping it light. And he went, no, this isn't a tour like what you do. This is, this is proper war. Proper war? Somebody's not done a gig in Wigan, have they? <laughs> I mentioned Wigan, I actually love Wigan. The reason I mention it is a good friend of mine, Karen Bailey, she's a stand-up, and she has this rule, which a lot of comics abide by. If you do a gig and it's hell, and like you die on your ass, you spend the money on something you want rather than on your bills. And I've wanted this necklace for so long. It's a little trumpet. It's called the Blow Your Own Trumpet Necklace. But it's £110, and I just can't justify that. I couldn't justify that on a necklace. Then I went to Wigan. <laughs> I did a gig for £120. They were homophobic. They hated me. Thank you, Wigan. <laughs> Favourite thing I've ever bought. Oh, the worst gig. The worst gig was on a Virgin flight for Virgin Atlantic. I wasn't allowed to talk about it contractually for a while. I am now. They're wankers. <laughs> agreed to it on the basis the people on the flight would know some comedy was happening. They didn't. So it took off between Edinburgh and London, it was. Cabin crew did their announcements, and then they were just like, Joe, perform. So I stood up. Front row were a load of businessmen on laptops. At one point, one of them did laugh, and I thought, well, I've done well there. Then I realised he was watching Friends. <laughs> Second row were a Muslim family with children all wearing hijabs. I'm sure very nice. Probably not into poo out knob in gags. <laughs> Somebody tried to walk out. <laughs> I, was, I was meant to do 10 minutes. I did 2 minutes and 43 seconds. They helpfully told me afterwards. And I don't check Twitter, I don't search my own name on Twitter, but Mum does. She found this tweet which was just on a virgin flight between Edinburgh and London, and one of the cabin crew got up and did some shit comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Well, that'll go on the DVD, won't it? Smash it. <laughs> yes. Johnny, in the TA. Did not know what to do about him. For a while, and then I realised I know exactly what to do about you, Johnny. I'll use Claire's wisdom. I'll use Claire's philosophy. I'll be ever so slightly weird with you. And I don't think this is this weird. I said to him, I said, I don't like the name Johnny. I'm going to call you... René. <laughs> and then every time he said something hurtful, often it was misogynist, it just made me think that he was the butler to the Duchess. And it just took the sting out of everything he tried. God knows how it worked, but he hated it. I managed it maximum four times. We are in a nightclub that evening. Woman walked past us, and he leant over to me and went, look at those great jugs. About a woman, it's the 21st century. The only time I've said, look at those great jugs, is in the glassware section of John Lewis. <laughs> The only time that's acceptable now, I'm afraid. And I went, oh, yes, lovely jugs, René. And he grabbed me, pulled me to one side. He went, right, let's get this sorted before the rest of the stag do continues. You've got two choices. We can be friends, or you can keep calling me René. <laughs> do you know what? I'll take root to be, please, René. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't. I agreed to it. I agreed to it reluctantly, because I was trying to be diplomatic, and we were sharing the same hostel together. Lads, lads, lads. And I just, um, <laughs> just avoided him for a couple of days. That's what I did. I did go into the group the one day. I said, oh, I'm just off to the shop to get some shampoo. Does anyone want anything? And he went, oh, can you get me some condoms? So I bought him a pack of condoms. And he looked at them and he went, oh, I don't like these. They're too tight. Any condom you buy, you can fit over your own head. <laughs> if it's too tight, you have a medical emergency, I'd argue. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's using them wrong, some sort of sleeping pack system. I don't know. I've me a little condom. I don't know. But he came out of the shower the one day, and he had his body out, a little towel around him, and I spotted a tattoo on his hip there. And I don't have a problem with tattoos. I don't have any myself. But it was a quote. And you know how I feel about quotes. <laughs> Claire wanted a quote tattoo at one point, but she doesn't really read. And <laughs> she said to me, she's like, do you know any good quotes? And I was like, well, I'll Google some. I found one that she quite liked. It was, um, I believe in one thing only the power of human will. And she's like, oh, that's lovely. Who's that by? Stalin! <laughs> I'd Googled quotes by evil people. That's what I'd done. She could have had it. She could have had it. So I get it, you know. 
get a quote tattoo, fine, do whatever, I don't care. But just make sure you've read the book the quote's from. Because I said to Johnny, I said, oh, can I see what that quote is? And he went, oh, yeah, yeah. A few of the lads in the unit, we got drunk and got tattoos. Can't remember what it means exactly. It says, cogito ergo sum, which I think means I think I am. Now, some of us may know this. It means I think, therefore I am. So he was close. And I thought about it for a minute. I said, Johnny, you do know that quote's by a guy called Descartes. You do know Descartes' first name was René. <laughs> What was that? Google it, and he Googled it, so fuck off, we should scratch it out. <laughs> in for a penny, in for a pound. Says, you do know Descartes was a very prominent homosexual. It wasn't, I just made it up. And what, what that quote means is, I think, therefore I am. And what it means is, even if you think just a little bit that you're gay, you are gay. That's what it means. <laughs> That's true. We are not friends. We are not friends. He found out I was doing stand-up about it. He was ever so upset, rang me up. I said, don't worry, I've changed your name. They don't know you're called Peter. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a final thing and then I'm going to fuck off. Um... <laughs> so this is my favourite thing that's come as a result of me being a bit weird with somebody online. A friend of mine was looking for somewhere to live in London, which, as I'm sure you're aware, is quite expensive, quite difficult increasingly. He found somewhere on Gumtree that looked kind of promising, did a bit of emailing back and forth, realised pretty quickly this is probably a scam. And so he sent all the emails that he'd done already over to me and just did the subject heading, do your absolute worst. <laughs> A girl called Gemma, who was supposedly advertising this property, I sent her a fresh email. I said, hello, Gemma. I'm contacting you regarding the apartment listed on Gumtree. I'm interested in a viewing and wanted to arrange. Regards, Joe Lysett. Used my own name on this one. I got a reply. Hello, Mr. Joe. The flat is situation in the London borough of Islington, a beautiful area with park and facilities. I had a look on Google Maps for the nearest facilities. They are Pentonville Prison. <laughs> In order to do the viewing, I would need to come to you from my residence in Stockholm. This is obviously very expensive for me, so I need assurance that you are interested and have available funding. I need you to pay a deposit of 220 US dollar, which you will have returned to you immediately on viewing. This is to be arranged by my trusted partner, moneytoindia.eu. <laughs> Nothing suspicious about that. I will also need your current address to send documentation to. Please contact me to arrange. Thanks, Gemma. So I just turned the weirdness up just a little notch. I said, Hi, Gemma. Thanks for your speedy reply. What a coincidence that you are in Stockholm. I am on holiday there right now. <laughs> I wasn't, of course. I was in my garden in Birmingham having a glass of Prosecco. <laughs> Let's meet and discuss and arrange the viewing. My current address is 118 New Oxford Street, London, WC1A, 1HL. That is the address of a Dorothy Perkins. <laughs> Joe Lysett, she replied, Mr. Joe, I am not currently in Stockholm, actually, but I'm on business for the next three weeks in Berlin. The best way to secure a viewing is to pay the deposit using money to India.eu. Thank you, Gemma. So I just turned the weirdness up just another little notch. <laughs> Guten Tag, Frau Gemma! <laughs> that is so crazy! I just booked a holiday to Berlin next week. Where are you staying? I can't wait to meet you. I also booked Ich weiß, das ist ein Betrug, which is German for I know this is a scam. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. She didn't spot it. She said, Mr. Joe, I will be very busy in Berlin and will not be able to see you. You must pay the deposit or I cannot secure the viewing. Thank you, Gemma. So I left it another couple of days and I just sent, Gemma, I'm here. Where are you? <laughs> I have been to Berlin about a year or so ago, so I attached a picture of me from that holiday at Potsdamer Platz just to give it a sense of realism, you know, put the willies up her. By Mr. Joe, I'm no longer in Berlin on business. If you would like a viewing, you need to pay the deposit. I'm happy to reduce to 200 USD through my trusted partners at moneytoindia.eu, Gemma. So I replied, Gemma, what a pity. I'm here all alone. <laughs> and I realised I don't know what you look like, so I've just been shouting Gemma for an hour. <laughs> I suppose I will have to pay the deposit. I hope you don't mind, but I have an old friend who works at the FBI, and I'm just going to ask him to do a quick check to make sure this isn't a scam. Thanks, Joe. Pretty quick reply to that one. Mr. Joe, the property is no longer available, sadly, so the check will not be necessary. Please confirm you've received this. I didn't reply. Got another one. Mr. Joe, did you receive my last email? The property's... To be honest, I've got quite a few of these. Some are quite manic, like in bold, this kind of thing. So I'm really panicked. Like, Mr. Joe, property no longer available. 
I left it another couple of days, and then I replied. Frau Gemma. <laughs> In order to secure cancellation of FBI check, I need you to pay me deposit. <laughs> of 300 USD through my trusted partner, money2joe.org. <laughs> Either that or perhaps just an apology and a promise that you'll stop trying to scam people out of their money and find a more honest way to make a living, wherever you're based. Thanks, Joe. To be honest, I didn't expect to reply to that one, but I did get one. Mr. Joe, I'm sorry. I promised to make a better life. <laughs> Gemma. So I replied, Gemma, apology accepted. And remember, money isn't everything. Often the Prosecco in Aldi is better than the one in Waitrose. <laughs> Follow your own path. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out. Why don't you show why?